Hello, hello. Welcome to episode number eight from the North. Um, we're coming out a little uh, one day late because, you know, we had real life responsibilities to take care of. But as you guys can see, we are both wearing orange in Today celebration. Today's a great day. Well, this week, this entire week has been a great week. What, what are we celebrating, it. Hermano? T -t Tell the In this people. show, we, we really take little wins to heart and we, we take uh, our time to truly celebrate them. And this week, we are celebrating the extradition of international money launder Alex Saab. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about this week because there is so much to uncover with this case and so much misinformation um, to clarify, right? Um, so let's get down to it. In our orange outfits, let's talk about Colombian money launder Alex Saab. Um, who is this guy, Edo? We should we should first of all start with what he's accused of because, of course, the Chavista International Misinformation Machine has been moving like never before to stop the extradition of this guy. You know what it reminded me of? Um, like watching all the Pablo Escobar shows. Yeah. Like his number one goal was to stop the extradition, and that's what uh criminals abroad always want to stop because they they truly rather die in their own countries where they can get away with anything than being extradited to the u.s you know what's funny about alex sad though is that he wouldn't be saving to his own country because let's remind the audience alex sab it's not venezuelan he's colombian look at me look at me alex sab it's not venezuelan He's Colombian. So That's right. he will be safer in Venezuela, not because he's Venezuelan, but because he's a big fish for the regime. So he cannot go back to Colombia. He cannot go back to any country that's not an ally of Venezuela because this is what's going to happen. This and that's <laughs> where he made his fatal mistake because... um. So I don't remember when uh, he was indicted for conspiracy to commit money laundering and so yesterday was the court appearance is one conspiracy to commit money laundering and i think seven uh charges of money laundering so once this happened uh alex Saab, and by the way it was uncovered by venezuelan journalism shout out to armando info who uh did so much journalism about this character in fact uh the journalist um he had to leave venezuela after he published this on alex Saab. so alex Saab got caught when he was traveling from one country allied to the regime to another um, and he stopped in Cape Verde to refuel his jet plane. And that's when he was apprehended. And he stayed there for nearly a year while the U.S. asked for his extradition and the Venezuelan regime tried to fight it with everything they have. I mean, I've never seen the regime working this hard for anything. And on Sunday, was it that he was extradited or Saturday? I think it was Saturday and he was presented on Monday. So over the weekend, finally, uh, the a U.S. Justice Department airplane flew to Cape Verde to pick up Alex Saab and bring him here to Miami to face justice. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm, I, I, I'm thrilled. And, and something that I want to touch, very important, when brings us to the second point of Alex Saab, we already said he's not Venezuelan. But a lot of the people who are out there defending him, following the regime line, um, is that Alex Sab, uh, they're saying that Alex Sab is um, it's a, it's a diplomat. It's a Venezuelan diplomat. Uh, so we already, you know, pretty much uh, told you guys why he's not Venezuelan, because he wasn't born in Venezuela. Pretty straightforward. Uh, but he's also not a diplomat. He was made a diplomat to prevent extradition once he was already apprehended in Cape Verde. So no, he wasn't a diplomat. <laughs> That's right. As a matter of fact, when uh, reporting started coming out about who this guy was, the regime um, denied having anything to do with him. Like, they didn't accept this relationship until they were fighting this extradition. 
It's, yep, it's, it's, if you, obviously, if you haven't been paying attention, like, for example, every uh, person in Venezuela has that's interest in politics, we have been paying attention to this whole process ever since it began, yeah, you might listen to what the regime or the friends and propaganda machine of the regime has to say, but when you really look into it, if you just read 20 minutes about the whole Alex Sapp case, you realize that it's all bull crap. He's but not- let's let's call out the misinformation. I want to read uh, Ben Norton's tweet because they all, of course, you know, they get uh, their rhetorical points from the regime and all these groups. Uh, in the first world, just repeat the false claims. Put it on the We're screen. About code pink. Um, Ben Norton. What's the other one? The D- gray zone guy. DSA. DSA. You know all the usual characters. So this is what they're claiming, and I'm reading Ben Norton's tweet. Which, by the way, the machine activated as soon as we heard that Alex Saab was being extradited. We see all these characters immediately uh, start speaking out this this misinformation about the case. So Ben Norton said the U.S. rogue state just ripped up every international law after imprisoning and now extraditing Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab. Again, not Venezuelan, not a diplomat. Diplomatic immunity is dead. The U.S. empire killed it. Now all foreign diplomats are a fair game to be kidnapped and imprisoned if Washington wants to. Well... Another lie that they're saying, by the way, Code Pink even created a, a nor uh, a change.org uh, petition petition to demand the freedom of Alex Saab. And what they're claiming is that Alex Saab's only crime is getting around U.S. sanctions to find food for Venezuelans. <laughs> Let's get that straight, because Alex Saab's crimes are more than just financial thuggery um they're crimes against humanity really um alex ab first of all u.s sanctions do not apply to food and medicine no matter let's what get that straight please and says this it's not a new thing it's always been like this we've always been saying this but it's just easy for the regime to say, hey, you know, we are being sanctioned, that's why we can't get food, that's why we can't get medicines, because people love reading the headline. People love reading the headline. Anyone who confirms... And world leaders love making it about them, so it's always any country having a problem? What did we do to cause it? Because we are the center of the world. And there's this little thing that I learned in class the other day, uh, this is not something that I'm just too intelligent and I knew, I just learned this about the other day, um... There's this thing called confirmation bias. Um, so obviously, if you are an American citizen, that you don't like the American government, and that's completely fair, that you're right, um, and you read something that diminishes or kind of goes against the, the US government and, and what they're doing and how they're handling the Venezuela situation, and instead of, you know, looking at the new ones, start doing your own research, see what's the actual situation, you just stick to the headline, you retweet it, and you say, fuck the US government. Um, so don't do that. Don't, the bottom line is, don't do that. Actually, do your research. <laughs> Let's talk about the cr- Alex Saab's crimes. So he's accused of being the main money launderer for the Venezuelan regime, which we know has stolen billions from the Venezuelan state. And he did so through the CLAP program. The CLAP program are, you know, the boxes of food that the regime would hand out to Venezuelan families. Um, And this was uh, the main source of food for a lot of Venezuelans, particularly during uh, the really bad um, crisis uh, back in 2017 when people were dying of hunger. Um, so what Alex Saab did was take money from the Venezuelan state, launder it but with the excuse that he was getting around U.S. sanctions to get food for Venezuelans for the CLAP program. Which again is not an was, excuse. Which is not an excuse. And he was actually providing the most, the poorest 
most vulnerable Venezuelan families with food that had no nutritional value. There have been studies done about this, that Venezuelan babies were fed with milk that had no nutritional value. Now, this means that the growth of these kids will be forever affected. We're talking about a whole generation that's been malnourished through the food that Alex Saab was providing in order to launder money that the Venezuelan regime was stealing from the state. And we uh, something that is very interesting about the clap boxes, the food boxes that the government provides, is that usually the conversation um, ends there. Uh, the government has these boxes, they give it to people so they can f freaking eat, right? But there's this thing about the clap boxes that they're also being used as a political tool in Venezuela ever since they became a thing. Ever since they became a thing. It's not that everyone can access a clap box. It's not that you can go say, hey, I'm a Venezuelan citizen. Here's my Venezuelan ID. Can I have a box? It doesn't work like that. Um, essentially, it's distributed to uh, the communal councils. So these are organizations, uh, s small organizations that kind of usually they have control over some areas, uh, especially the poorest areas of the country. We're talking about the barrios, we're talking about rural areas, etc, etc. And they keep track of everything that's happening in their own community. And they keep track of what people in their own community would do. That includes doing things that go against the government. That includes things as normal and that should be a human right for everyone as protesting because you don't have water or food sending a tweet or electricity sending a tweet uh to the point that they will actually check who you voted for if there's an election and if you didn't vote for the government candidate or if you didn't vote at all that can affect whether or not you get your food so not only this boxes have no nutritional value whatsoever they can barely get you through so you don't starve um not only are they being used to launder venezuelan money uh which we're gonna find out more about how that works as this hearing keeps going as we as we find more information about alex Sab in the united states uh but it's also it, the, the main problem with the clap food uh, is that it's being used as a political tool. And it shouldn't have to be a political tool if people in Venezuela were not starving, if they didn't need to get food boxes from the government, if they can just work and go to a supermarket and buy the stuff there. Because if you work in Venezuela, minimum wage is about $4 a month. That's nothing to get you through. Um, and if that's you do why these type of that's why these type of regimes use hunger as a tool. It is. It's not a mistake. It's not a mistake. They do it on purpose. And even if you do have the money, um, you might have a hard time finding stuff because again, Venezuela. If it's not imported, you're probably not gonna find it. If it's imported, it's gonna be in U.S. dollars. Nobody has U.S. dollars. If it's nationally produced, it's gonna be regulated and controlled by the government. So good luck finding those. So yeah, the whole idea of the it's it's a it looks like a good idea because if you tell people oh the government just gives boxes of food to everyone that's poor that sounds great in paper but that's not what clap is about and I mean it, it doesn't even sound good in paper to me because it's like again and that just gets us gets us into the S word socialism but once you're relying on a government to feed you that is way too much power for a government. Um, and again, it wasn't just that he was providing food that had no nutritional value. He was stealing money through this program, like millions and millions of dollars that he would then deposit in other countries and whatnot. Hopefully... Sorry to we'll interrupt you, but it's not millions. It's billions of dollars that he handled. Right. He uh, allegedly... At one point, he actually had $2 billion on a single bank account to his name. All right, just to give you a perspective. And this guy, Edu, must have a lot of information. I've been wondering, what can this guy know that the regime is working so hard for him not to talk? Something I want to point out as well, I don't know if you saw it. 
um, right after the extradition, the regime organized a fake protest in Caracas with pictures of Alex Saab saying, free Alex, uh, a hero of Venezuelan. And they had his 25-year-old sugar baby wife on stage. Who's not Venezuelan. Reading. She's Italian, <laughs> yeah. but also they can't go to Italy because Italy already found out that they were also laundering money there. So they took their assets. So they had her. I mean, this really looked like a hostage situation. And she's up there, this young girl, this young, beautiful girl. I think she was a model. Crying as she reads... Um, uh, a letter supposedly from Alex Saab promising that he will not say anything, basically. Um, and a lot of analysts saw that as the regime sending a message to Alex Saab of, hey, we got your wife, we got your kids, so not you only, better keep it quiet. Not only that, Hed, but it gets worse. Obviously, this is... All speculation, because we at the end yes. of the day, we cannot tell what what's going through the minds of the regime. But, you know, we are also humans, we're smart, and we can put two and two together. So, not only we had that event of Alex Sapp's wife in Caracas, very distressed, talking about the Alex Sapp situation, and reading what obviously seems to be a government message. Um, but, allegedly... According to the, the Venezuelan government, Alex Sapp also put out a statement saying that he was not going to commit suicide. This is something that's very normal under actual authoritarian regimes. This happened a lot, especially let's take you guys back to Hong Kong. Please not never forget about Hong Kong and the Hong Kong people. But this was very common back in Hong Kong when they got students. They will always yell to the cameras, I will not commit suicide. This is to say that, you know, if, if then, you know, you get in prison and then you, you know, end up dead in prison, people can put two and two together and say, well, you know, I, it wasn't him. It was the government. But that the Venezuelan government is actually the one saying this about Alex Sab makes me think that the message that they're trying to tell him is do not talk. And if you have to take the bullet, do it. Do it. And this is a very, very, very grim. Additionally, it came out again this week, in part thanks to the US justice system, in part thanks to Venezuelan journalists. And thank you so much to everyone that has looked into this. You guys are bringing us justice for once. Um, they also put out a, a letter. I, 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 again, this is all allegedly. Please do your own research. But they put out a letter by the Venezuelan government sent to Alex Sab when he was still in Cape Verde in the very first days of him being um, taken into custody by the Cape Verde uh, authorities. Um, pretty much telling him, dude, you have a lot of confidential information. And let me remind you, you work for the Venezuelan government. If you open your mouth, we're going to go after you. But we're also going to make our best efforts so they don't extradite you to the States. But I want to let you know, if you open your mouth, we're going after you. And that's on the letter. You can read it. It's online. Please go and watch it. We also, but I wanted to give a shout out to Cape Verde because, I mean, who would have thought a small, relatively unknown country in Africa would stay strong and not succumb to pressure from the Venezuelan regime? Like, I'm sure... Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm speculating, but seeing um, that we know how these type of authoritarian regimes act, particularly the Chavista regime, I mean, I'm sure they offered all kinds of money to even the prison guards to let this man go. And still, after, you know, conducting their own process and their due investigation, Cape Verde ended up extraditing the criminal. So... Go ahead, Elu. No, I was going to say after, just adding to that, just after hearing all of the things that the defense had to say, after appeal, after appeal, after appeal, they went through the whole judicial right. process. Yeah. 
but, and it seems to me that they did a good job because they listened to everything that the defense had to say. Because again, I think the Venezuelan regime maybe was confused seeing an actual judicial process because they don't do that in their own country. They so maybe they thought something was wrong. There hasn't been justice in Venezuela for over 20 years. So I'm pretty sure they just forgot how that works. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that happened. Props to Cape Verde. I like, I I'm going to be honest here. I had my doubts all along the process that you know he was not going to be extradited um but props to cape verde for this result thank love you love you cape verde thank you for well, not thank you for not succumbing to the regime thank you so much and of all the things that we've said so far it's clear that the regime is doing a lot of effort to prevent alex Saab from well being extradited in the first place and now from actually opening his mouth so why is it? What is it that Alex Sapp knows? You know, I have wondered that because I don't think there's anything he could say that could really lead to the overthrowing of the regime. I don't know. Because we know they, they launder money. We know they steal. We So I'm like, what, what can he say that the regime so badly does not want us to know? I have an idea. Maybe... Maybe actual account numbers where the money is, that's, things like that. Is it all about money, really? Because they're acting as if it's their survival at stake. It's. It, I think it's all about the money. Again, please, guys, do not take take this with a grain of salt. This is all speculating. We're not gonna know f the facts for sure until we actually uh, see what's happening with the hearings and with the judicial system in the U.S. We're not gonna have the facts until we actually see what's going on out of there. But in Venezuela, there's this concept that I don't think has a translation in English, maybe it does, which is called testaferro. And essentially what it is, if you guys want to think about the mafia, uh, the mafia will all, sometimes they will have a person that's not necessarily related to them, but still works with them. So they can be the, the person handling all the money, handling all the corruption, and then if you know if this person falls like alex Sapp, for example being in prison then it's gonna be harder to track what he did to what the actual uh the people are profiting from from this whole enterprise are which is at the end of the day the venezuelan regime alex Sapp seems to be the biggest fish in this category the biggest yeah. test of like Two billion dollars, it's just an insane amount of money. And we've been speculating for a while that the CLAP program, it's the main money laundering machine for the regime. Now that we have the head of that program, or well, not that program, but the head of the corruption of that program, well, we can get a lot of good stuff here. Like, a lot of good stuff. We're not talking like what we got from, from the Panama Papers, which was big. What we got from Andorra, which was big, now we actually may have a complete idea and scheme of how the Venezuelan corruption machines operate. Because we know they're corrupt, we're just not 100% sure as to how they do it. And again, you know, we are at a point where no matter how the no matter how much the tankies want to repeat that the US is really uh entering all these different countries to try to overthrow regime the truth of the matter is that all the u.s really can do to fight this regime these type of regimes now is go after their money so that's their biggest uh weapon against chavismo right now it is and it is and uh the, it, like again i we, i can tell you like enough how important it this whole thing feels for us and for me um hopefully We'll get a good result out of this. Hopefully, this will harm the regime in their economic funds and in their money laundering scheme. Uh, all the governments that are operating with the government through the CLA, uh, sorry through the CLAP program with the government, including the government of Mexico, Lopez Obrador. I'm looking at you. Could be involved in a big corruption scandal as well. 
So, Elu, let's talk about the regime's response mm -hmm. because, well, we already talked about the protests in Caracas where they uh, exhibited Saab's wife. Oh, by the way, there was also a protest in New York City by a bunch of white men who were demanding the U.S. regime free Saab. I'm going to put the images here because it's just so funny. I was like, Elu, why weren't we there to go to Times Square and just make a scene? You know, I, I would have loved it. I would have loved it. So this is a this is an open letter to the U.S. government. The, 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 uh, please give me a visa <laughs> <laughs> to go fight tankies in Times Square. I want to fight tankies in Times Square. Please let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, aside from uh, these supposed protests, um, there were some real consequences from the U.S. extradition of Alex Saab. As expected, the regime got up from the negotiation table in Mexico. And all the first world Latin American experts seem surprised. Whoa! Now this really shows that the Chavista government, no, that's not what they say. They would say that the Venezuelan government's priorities are not where they should be with the Venezuelan people. Um, duh! No, duh, duh. Like, have you been paying attention? <laughs> but no, some, people are, some people are realizing that. But then there's this group of people that... The takeaway that they got from this whole situation was that the reason why the Venezuelan negotiations fell apart in Mexico was not because of the Venezuelan regime scaring and, and, and going into full panic mode over Alex Sapp and, you know, trying to... Wait, sorry, I, we have to mention that they had already... I mean, this negotiation... They're not even negotiations. This sham show in Mexico has been ridiculous from the start because the regime had said they demanded that Alex Saab as their diplomat join these talks again it, not a diplomat <laughs> but yeah that, that, that was the, that was that was what the, their demands were so they stood up from the negotiation table and what it and not only that, but we should also mention, uh, as retaliation for Alex Sapp, they also imprisoned, they were already imprisoned, but they, they... They took them from house arrest. They took them from house arrest. Six American citizens that live in Venezuela and they work for Citgo. Um, pretty much as hostages. They didn't live in Venezuela, Edu. That case is crazy. They lived in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the regime needed some pawns with uh, American citizenship. So they tricked them into going to Venezuela for a meeting where they arrested them and they have been arrested for, I think, over four years now. So, yeah, essentially hostages. They are hostages. This is not that the Venezuelan regime decided the same day that Alex Sapp was being taken, you know, to the United States, they decided, oh, well, you know what, we're actually going to start a process for these guys that we just happened to kidnap a couple months ago, right? But the takeaway is that somehow this is Biden's fault, that the negotiations falling apart, it's because of the U.S. government dealing with Alex Sapp. Some people are even going as far as saying that why are we caring about Alex Sapp if the if the Venezuelan government is not going anywhere? We should this care. This is as usual, both the far right and the far left. I now call them the America first crowd because they both are always saying America first. Why are we doing anything in other countries? Some people have even gone as far as saying, you know what? American first, we, you know, if, if all it takes to get six, Amedic, uh, six American citizens back into uh, the United States safe and sound, it's to stop persecuting Alex Sapp, then we should do it because America first. That's incredibly stupid. That's incredibly offensive. That's incredibly racist. <laughs> And that's because you're saying that six American lives are worth more than 30 million Venezuelan lives, and, basically. And let me tell you, they're not. Every human life is as valuable as the next one. Um, so, so yeah, this is that that kind of take just just makes me so mad because it just it shows you what the establishment. And by the establishment, I not necessarily mean the the big media or whatever. I mean what the average political 
interest person in America thinks is that everything should be looked at from the United States lens. That everything should be looked at at what are the consequences? What is the US gaining from this? What is the US losing from this? Should we do it? Should we not do it? And should we be part of the world or should we not be a part of the world? We should just care about our own interest. And we live in a globalized world. Not only that, but it is important for American safety to understand what's happening in Venezuela. Because let me remind you, Venezuela is just three hours away from Florida. This is not China all across the world. This is not North Korea all across the world. This I mean, is on it's your also doorstep. the biggest migration crisis in our region. It's, so. it's the biggest migration crisis in the region, the same region where the U.S. is. So it, it's not as easy as saying, you know what, six American lives in exchange for Alex Sapp. Doesn't work like that. And look around you. There is now an arepa restaurant or place every three blocks all over the US. So just just Google arepa near me and you can see how it affects you, the crisis in Venezuela. Don't you think that all Venezuelan Americans living in, in the United States, I, I believe we're almost half a million of us and more on their way, that's for sure. Um, don't you think they also have family that are back home and are suffering directly because of this? By the way, I'm an American citizen too, so... <laughs> there you go. And there are many Venezuelan Americans who do care about these issues. So, but Elu, I wanted to point out because I am so fed up with the indignity of the Venezuelan opposition. Because oh. at least the regime, they're protecting their thug. But... The so we need to talk about this again. The regime got up from the negotiation table in Mexico because the U.S. got their thug and they have to protest it. Meanwhile, General Raúl Baduel died also last week while in prison for political reasons without a trial, and that wasn't enough for the opposition to get up from the table themselves. Oh, yeah. Is there anything that the regime can do where the opposition will be, okay, no, I will not negotiate with you if you are killing le or letting political prisoners die. We have to talk about this, uh, Elu, because who was Raul Baduel? One, a main, I mean, the main uh, general ally of Hugo Chavez at the beginning. As a matter of fact, he is the number one person who helped Chavez return to power after, after the 2002 coup because he was the one who had the military. Well, Baduel eventually jumped the boat and immediately became uh, an enemy of the regime and had been in jail for like five years without a trial. His son was in jail with him too. The regime says he died from COVID. His family says they don't know that that's true. We don't know what happened. Either way, sketchy situations, in jail, without a trial, horrible conditions. He's dead now. No, that wasn't enough for the opposition to have some dignity and get out from the table. But the regime did it for their thug. I mean, it's just, we can't win here. It, it serves to show what we pretty much been saying over the last episode is that the interests of the Venezuelan opposition, at least the opposition that's currently Mexico negotiating with them, are not the interest of the Venezuelan people. Because, and I have very strong opinions of Baduel, because I don't forget the things that he did for the government in the beginning, what he did for Chavez. But at the end of the day, it's another political prisoner that's has been pretty much murdered by the regime. One of many. Like, it, this is not an isolated situation. And I always say this in the show, these uh, socialist communist regimes, they save their harshest punishment for those who turn on them. I mean, what they did to Baduel and his family, it, it, it was just cruel. And, and anyone could have seen it coming that the end was gonna gonna be this one because the regime could never have Baduel in freedom because they know he would have some pull uh, as a former Chavez ally. And that's why you see that many ex 
chavistas that were part of the machine, that were part of the regime, none of them are living in Venezuela anymore. Uh, but, but but sorry, sorry to interrupt. But just, just back to my point. It, like this whole thing just serves to prove that the interests of the opposition are not aligned with the interests of the Venezuelan people because we are the ones that are in danger of becoming political prisoners tomorrow. And by we, I mean Venezuelans still in Venezuela. Thank to God, we're not there anymore. But if you as an opposition are telling me that Baduel was not important enough, like any other political prisoner is, um, for you to at least stand up and walk away from the negotiation tables, while at the same time, just a month ago, all of your political prisoners were pardoned so they can go back to Venezuela and run for phony elections, which, by the way, the opposition is still going to go with after the government just pretty much kicked the negotiation tables, which the whole purpose of the thing was to have free and fair elections in a couple of weeks. They're still going to participate in those. So it, 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 it really proves yet again that the opposition, they're only there for themselves. It's a joke. And I want to read you this tweet, Elu, because it's an example of what you're saying of where the establishment opposition is. It's a message by Jesus Chua Torrealba, who at one point was uh, the establishment opposition's main spokesman. Mm -hmm. um, he basically says on this tweet, is Alex Saab a hero or a villain? Justice will decide. Oh my God. This this was an opposition leader that doesn't know that Alex Saab, whether Alex Saab is a hero or a villain? If you don't, if you have, like, if you need an answer to that question, then you're just either fucking stupid or you're pretending to be. You're pretending to be. And again, we are not being reactionary here. We have read the journalism exposing what this man did, which will result in millions of Venezuelan children seeing their growth affected. Millions, millions, billions of dollars that could be used to help Venezuelans that are starving, that could be used for Venezuela's social programs, which are all on the ground, by the way, props to socialism for that. But no, no, you're using this money for your own wealth. You're using I just got so pissed, like, just reading that again. This is someone who was the opposition spokesperson. And then you wonder why us Venezuelans who are against the regime feel so homeless. Because the sp former spokesman for supposedly our side can't even speak out against the regime's main money launder. It's stupid. It's stupid. It's, 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 it sounds silly, but it's disrespectful. It's so it's disres disrespectful. It's, it's, so, it's so disrespectful to all of us, right? But... And again, the stakes are so high here because now let's talk about um, Alex Saab's court appearance, you know. Of course, again, because we don't get much wins on our side because even our supposed opposition leaders are out here trying to be balanced and asking the world whether Alex Saab is a hero or a villain. We were very excited about Alex Saab being extradited. So yesterday when he appeared in court, I mean, all of Venezuela was like trying to check the stream. We wanted to see him in his orange suit. We wanted to see the court appearance so much that the judge had to, you know, say, let me remind journalists and everyone here that you cannot take pictures of a court appearance. You could be prosecuted with crimes because every Venezuelan journalist was there just sending the picture out. Um, Alex Saab's human rights will be respected in this country, unlike Baduel's human rights, unlike Capitan eh, Rafael Acosta Arevalo, who was so beat up when he showed up in court that he couldn't stand up. He died the next day from his injuries after the Venezuelan regime tortured him to get him to speak. I can assure you Alex Saab will not be tortured no matter what... Um, the, the tankies and the communist propaganda wants to say. So he was assigned a public defendant that my taxes are paying for because that's democracy. So if you compare Alex Saab's prison situation 
to those in Venezuela. I mean, Alex Saab will be eating better food than the food he was providing to Venezuelan children here. So think about that. Think about what that means. And, you know, when, when you know, if you're in, you know, you, you want to learn and that's great. That's a whole idea of this. This space is for people that are maybe are not very familiar with the situation in countries such as Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera. Even though we focus mainly on Venezuela, because of course we're Venezuelans. Um, just look at the facts, you know, what we told you is just one perspective, but it's also the perspective of pretty much every Venezuelan <laughs> that doesn't work for the regime. Um, I mean, you could see it on Twitter. Millions of Venezuelans across the world were celebrating this guy's extradition. Like, I had American friends tweet me, like, who is this Alex Saab? Because everyone's we having were a party. just up in arms about it. Because, uh, again, there's no justice in Venezuela. So the fact that this guy is going to face an actual justice system and have his human rights respected, have a public defend a public defense lawyer if he needs it. I mean, it it's just incredible for us because we don't we don't get this. And, we haven't seen this. And speaking of with the fact that yeah, we don't have we 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 haven't been able to access Venezuela's justice system for a while now. So there's no justice whatsoever in Venezuela. Um, so every time that a Venezuelan wants to, you know, make a claim or have some justice, they have to resort to uh, uh, other justice systems. Uh, but this also works for the opposition. Um, we really didn't prepare this for the show, but we were talking about that on, on, on WhatsApp. And I think it's worth mentioning that Leopoldo Lopez... You know the guy. We don't have to introduce it to you. Um, but if you don't, leading we Venezuela. We talked about him last week. We talked about him last week, so just go watch that episode. Leopoldo Lopez uh, has announced that he would be introducing a. I don't know how you say that in Spanish. Uh, a lawsuit, a libel lawsuit. A libel lawsuit, but for defamation? Is that how you say it? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. For defamation against the, the journalist to uncover. Uh, the monomero situation. No, uh, not the journalist. Isn't it against the? He was a uh, an interim government official. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Against it, it, he was a. Um, he was the ambassador in Colombia, I believe. He was the ambassador of Colombia. So now that this whole situation came up, which is a big corruption scandal with the the the, the opposition in Venezuela. That just by the way, shout out to my mom who first reported it, and everyone was like. <gasps> There she goes again, trying to destroy the interim government and lying. Yes, it yeah, was true. It was true. And what the Venezuelan opposition is doing now, they're using the Spanish justice system to kind of go against this claims of alleged corruption in the, so the interim government. So there was a source for the report. He said the company was being mismanaged. A all whistleblower, of that. yeah. A whistleblower, exactly. He was essentially a, bliss, a, a whistleblower. So the Polo Lopez wants to go against the whistleblower. Of, you know, but, uh, <laughs> it, it's sketchy. It's sketchy, but you know what? I'm not even surprised. I'm not expecting anything from the opposition at this point. But I know, I know a lot of people still are. So um, hopefully this, this will serve as a, a reminder of reality. They are not as bad as the government. They're still still pretty bad and still pretty corrupt. And yeah. They and this is why way. we get so excited when someone has to face the U.S. justice system because that's all we can rely on at this point because we don't even have opposition leaders that do anything for us. So this is a win for us. That's why we're wearing orange in honor of Alex Ab's extradition. His next court appearance will be on November 1st. Um, it's going to be on whether he gets bail or not. I mean, I, I reported on that and a lot of Venezuelans were like, what? They're even considering bail. But again, this is a democracy. This is a, a place where institutions work. And that's just how it is. Um, the prosecutors already said they will recommend that there is no bail because, of course, the, the flight risk is very, very real. This guy has very powerful and rich uh, allies. So I doubt that he will be given bail. But because justice works here, he will get his hearing on whether he should get bail with which by the way Edwin I don't really know why he has 
a public defendant, but for the first court hearing, he was given a, a public defendant, which I don't understand. Me neither. Uh, why I have to look into that because when he was in Cape Verde, the regime paid for the best defense team for him. So unclear why he doesn't have his own lawyers here so far. Maybe, this you know, just thinking maybe again, I, I, we don't have a clue what was what was the reason for that. But just maybe thinking maybe the lawyers are not allowed to like represent people from Venezuela due to the sanctions like Venezuelan government allies maybe that's what it is i don't know i don't know i'm gonna look into that but um yeah as of now i am gladly paying for alex Ab's defense um and yeah just remember he will get his day in court while political prisoners in venezuela sometimes never even get a trial like we said baduel had been in there for years without a trial Alex Saab can be promised a fair and speedy trial. Whether he wants to cooperate remains to be seen. Whether he will accept the regime's threat and stay silent and spend the rest of his days in a Florida prison cell, we'll definitely be following this case. And, and let's just hope, I don't have a lot of hope, mm -hmm. uh, but let's, let's hope that the information that he has uh can lead to, to can make us one step closer to freedom in venezuela we will keep an eye on that for sure we'll probably be talking about this in our following episodes as we get more updates as we get more information uh just a reminder for everyone there are a series of protests scheduled in cuba in the following weeks we will definitely keep an eye on that uh wishing those democracy fighters the best of the best of luck um yeah, uh, so with this in november it's gonna be uh protests in cuba and fake elections in nicaragua and in venezuela so we're so. gonna we're definitely gonna keep an eye on that um one last thing before we go i just wanted to mention we're gonna take this quick uh opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about this shirt um, so this shirt, it's to commemorate the, the, the resident schools in Canada. So if you guys are not aware, basically in Canada, uh, the Canadian government through the Anglican church and through the Catholic church, they had, uh, for many decades, a program of assimilation of, um, indigenous communities into Canada. Um, the whole purpose was allegedly to teach them Anglo French Canadian values, teach them Anglo French religion. Uh, civilized them because they were perceived as uncivilized um, in the last few decades Canada and the Canadian government have realized that that wasn't as easy as that in, in, in fact it was pretty horrible what was done to these indigenous communities uh, many kids were kidnapped were kidnapped from their families to be sent to these resident schools uh, many of which actually died in the resident schools um, this year, thousands and thousands of bodies of children have been found all across Canada. Um, so during, during September, during October, during this Thanksgiving, you know, kind of time period in Canada, uh, people wear orange and shirts like this uh, to commemorate the indigenous community. So if you didn't know that, now you know, you can look into that. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's something that all countries that have had indigenous communities that have been mistreated, that have been sometimes exterminated, can look into this as a positive example on how to realize, you know what, we fucked up. We need to start working together, build better for the future. So thank you everyone to for for catching up with us today. I was gonna say hopefully it, hopefully in Venezuela one day to be commemorating. Um, what we went through during this dictatorship uh, from a perspective of freedom. From a perspective of freedom, and not only that, but how the dictatorship, and it's well known, it's well documented, how they have gone after indigenous rights in Venezuela, indigenous lands, how they've taken their lands to sell them to the Chinese, to the Russians, and to the Iranians. That's your imperialist right there. Um, we need to look into that. Um, it's not racism and xenophobic and discrimination against indigenous communities is not something that it's unique to north american or european cultures uh if anything we're just hearing more from them because they're the first ones to kind of 
realize they've done fucked up and they're the first mm-hmm. ones talking about it. But eventually, we will need to have this conversation in Venezuela. Um, if we ever, when we become a democratic country again, we definitely need to look into that and start, start, start fixing, uh, start reparations for sure. Yeah. So thank you guys for joining us uh, on this episode and see you next week from the North. Take it easy, guys. Bye. <laughs>